Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases, but today we are going international. Today we are discussing a solved case that also happens to revolve around one of my other passions, aviation. For those that don't know, I am a flight attendant and this is a case where I am going to be incredibly interested to hear your thoughts because some people may take the side of the victim, others the killer. In fact, this killer is considered by some a national hero. There will no doubt be a lot of divided opinions on this one. As always, my sources are linked down below. And a friendly reminder, I discuss cases on this channel based on available news coverage, books, documentaries, etc. I am not a journalist, just somebody with an interest in researching and reading up on local or international cases, and I attempt to cover each case on this channel with as much respect for the victim or victims as possible and with as little bias as possible. My videos are not opinion pieces, nor are they presenting new information in any of the cases unless stated. Having said that, Let's get into it. So today we are heading back to the year of 2004 to the city of Zurich in Switzerland. There lived 36 year old air traffic controller Peter Nielsen. Peter, who was originally from Denmark, had moved to Zurich several years previous with his wife, Mette. The couple had three children, with the youngest being just a toddler. Peter worked for the company Skyguide, which I will discuss a little bit later in this video. I also do want to apologise in advance for any names I may pronounce wrong in this video. I am doing my best, but no doubt my Aussie accent will butcher at least a few words today, so I am really sorry. So on the afternoon of Tuesday, February 24, Peter Nielsen spotted a man sitting on the bench in his front garden. The man was unshaven, a stocky build, and aged in his late 40s or early 50s with an Eastern European appearance. It is unclear whether Peter recognised this person or not, but he would soon learn exactly who this man was. Peter went outside to talk to the man, with his children following close behind him. Meta soon called the kids back inside though. And it wasn't long after this that she heard a, quote, kind of scream come from the front garden. Meta rushed outside to find her husband lying on the ground in a pool of blood. She phoned the police, but by the time they arrived, Peter Nielsen had passed away from multiple stab wounds and his killer had fled. Right off the bat, the investigation had a clear description of Peter's killer, as his family, as well as a neighbour, had seen the man. In fact, the neighbour had actually spoken to the man. The neighbour had asked this mystery man what he was doing, as it appeared that he was just loitering around the neighbourhood. The man showed the neighbour a piece of paper with Peter Nielsen's name on it, so the neighbour pointed the man in the direction of Peter's house. The murder weapon? A jackknife with a 14 centimetre blade was also found near the crime scene. As far as potential suspects, one man in particular stood out to investigators. A 48-year-old Russian man named Vitaly Kaliev. Almost two years previous, in July of 2002, Vitaly had lost his wife and two children in a plane crash. Peter Nielsen had been the air traffic controller on duty when the crash happened. Although Peter was not considered to be at fault for the crash, he did receive heavy public blame when the incident first occurred. The company he worked for, Skyguide, actually took full responsibility for the crash, which we'll discuss in more detail in just a moment. At the one year anniversary of the plane crash held in Überlingen, Germany, where the plane actually planes went down, an agitated Vitaly very publicly called out Skyguide, but in particular he singled out Peter Nielsen 
Calling him scum. In the two years following the crash, Vitaly had made it his personal mission to find the person or persons responsible for the incident, although he claimed that all he wanted was an honest face-to-face -face apology. Someone to take responsibility for the death of his wife and children. Although Sky Guy did issue a public apology and offer the family's compensation, they had of course not personally apologized to each individual family affected, as is a pretty standard procedure in cases like this. Businesses don't businesses or companies don't tend to go to each family individually face to face and say sorry. They'll put out a statement for everyone. And as far as the compensation, Vitaly was offered 160,000 Swiss francs, which is about 172,000 USD. But he refused to take it. And in fact, he considered the offer an insult when all he was seeking, he claimed, was a personal apology. Vitaly even personally visited the Sky Guide offices to try and get some answers and to request to speak with Peter and get this apology that he so desperately wanted. But this apology never came. I get the feeling that Vitaly heavily believed in things like principle on certain matters at least, honour and pride, especially honour when it comes to family. It wasn't about the money. It was about someone standing up and saying to Vitaly, I did it and I'm sorry. But anyway, that's just my thoughts and opinions there. The reason Vitaly became suspect number one though, was because he happened to be in Zurich, Switzerland, where Peter lived when the murder occurred. Vitaly, who lived in southern Russia, which is at least a three-hour plane trip from Zurich, seemingly had no reason to be there. Plus, he was also the only family member of the plane crash victims to be in Zurich at that time. The police soon tracked Vitaly down in the suburb of Klotten in Zurich. He was staying in room 316 at the Welcome Inn Hotel, just a half an hour walk from Peter Nielsen's house. He initially denied any involvement in Peter's murder and he claimed that he had an alibi for the time of the killing. So before moving on, I'm going to attempt to explain the plane crash to you known as the Uber Lincoln plane crash, if you want to look it up in more detail. I'm going to try and not turn this into a full-blown episode of Air Crash Investigation, which is one of my favourite TV shows, but anyway, let's give this a go. On the night of Monday, July 1, 2002, Peter Nielsen was the only air traffic controller on duty when a series of tragic mistakes and unfortunate events unfolded that led to two aircrafts colliding in mid-air. Peter was in charge of monitoring an airspace that fell over parts of both Switzerland and Germany and during the night time this particular area was relatively quiet with just a few aircrafts passing by at any given time. Perhaps this is why the second air traffic controller that was supposed to be on duty this night, decided to go for an extended break. Skyguide's policy was actually to have two air traffic controllers on duty at all times, no matter how quiet it was. But this was a rule that had apparently not been followed for years and is just one of the factors that would lead to the following events. It was just after 11pm and as I said, this was usually a quiet time. But on this particular night, an unscheduled landing occurred that pretty much needed Peter's full attention. Maintenance happening that evening also meant the phones were down. So perhaps what would have usually been a pretty standard operation took up more of Peter's attention than usual. Meanwhile, two aircrafts were heading into Peter's airspace that were set to cross paths with each other, quite literally, if action wasn't taken. The aircrafts were the Bashkirian Airlines Flight 2937 and DHL Flight 611. 
The Bashkirian Airlines flight was a chartered Russian aircraft flying from Moscow in Russia to Barcelona in Spain. The flight was carrying 60 passengers, 45 of which were children, mostly on a school trip, and nine crew. Among these passengers were Vitaly's wife and children. The flight from Moscow to Barcelona was approximately 4 hours and 20 minutes, and the flight took off just before 9pm. Vitaly was actually waiting at the Barcelona airport for his family as he had been in Spain for work. I know nobody asked for this next part, but the flight attendant in me has to mention the aircraft was a Tupolev Tu-154, which is not really an aircraft I am familiar with, but from what I read up on, it's basically, or, or was, is, I'm not too sure, uh, Russia's workhorse short-haul aircraft. Maybe not too dissimilar to the Boeing 737, perhaps? I'm just guessing. They're kind of similar sizes, like layouts. Yeah, I don't know much about it, but anyway, it seems to have a similar purpose to the 737. The other aircraft, DHL Flight 611, was a cargo flight flying from Bergamo, Italy to Brussels in Germany. On board was just the two pilots, and the aircraft was a Boeing 757. So to explain what happened with the crash, I need to explain a little thing called TCAS. TCAS stands for Traffic Collision Avoidance System, and it's something aircrafts have to avoid mid-air collisions, as the name would suggest. For example, if two aircrafts get too close to one another, TCAS can recognise this and instruct an aircraft to either climb or descend to avoid a mid-air collision. I'm sure you would have guessed but I'm not a pilot, just a flight attendant. So that was my understanding of TCAS. If I did get anything wrong and you are a pilot or very knowledgeable in aviation, an engineer, comment down below and give me some more information on TCAS. So that night, TCAS did its job. It told the Bashkirian Airlines flight to climb and the DHL flight to descend. And this should have been the end of it, but as we know, it wasn't. Moments before the Bashkirian Airlines TCAS told them to climb, air traffic, aka PETA, told them to descend. So after a quick and confusing debate in the flight deck, the Russian pilots decided to follow Peter's instructions and descend. At the same time, unbeknownst to Peter, or the Bashkirian Airlines flight, the DHL flight was following TCAS and also descending, thus continuing along the same path towards a collision. For context, standard protocol is to follow TCAS over air traffic control, at least according to pilots at work I asked. So you may be wondering, why did the Bashkirian Airlines pilots not do this? As it turned out, the Bashkirian Airlines flight operations manual that was a mouthful, <laughs> actually instructed pilots to follow the instructions of air traffic over TCAS. However, I do believe it is now standard worldwide to follow TCAS, especially since this incident occurred. In most industries, but especially aviation, things have to be um, the same across the board or things can go wrong. Aviation is one of those industries that is very proce very procedural. I said that weird. Very procedural. Procedural. I, like, I cannot say that word. But you get my point. For example, having the two air traffic controllers on at all times. Seconds before the two planes collided, Peter told the Russian pilots to look out for the DHL plane coming from their right. Unfortunately, this was incorrect information and the DHL flight was in fact coming from their left. At the last second, the Russian pilot spotted the DHL plane and tried to go into a climb, but it was too late. Even if Peter had told them the correct information about what side the other aircraft was coming from, it can't be said for certain that the crash would have been avoided. The two aircrafts collided at 11.35 p.m. local time and went down in the city of Überlingen, Germany. Nobody survived. 
Another factor working against Peter Nielsen that night was the fact the STCA or short term conflict alert did not work. This, from what I understand, is a visual and oral alert given to air traffic control two minutes before a potential mid air collision. However, Peter never received this warning as the system was switched off for maintenance, like the phone. Nor was Peter even aware that the system was off that evening. Had it been switched on, this may have been the saving grace. Another air traffic tower actually did receive the STCA visual and attempted to contact Peter to warn him, but the phones were down, as I said, and as this airspace did not belong to this other air traffic control tower, they didn't contact the aircrafts to warn them, as is actually standard protocol. You aren't supposed to contact aircrafts that are not in your airspace unless the other air traffic controllers are dead or passed out. And of course, they had no proof or knowledge that this had occurred, so they left the situation alone. As I said earlier, Skyguide ended up taking full responsibility for the incident. Although it could be argued that many factors played a part in this crash. And by the way, Peter did continue to work for Skyguide up until his passing. In 2007, four Skyguide employees were actually found guilty of negligent homicide. Three received a one year suspended jail sentence and one paid a fine of 13,500 Swiss francs, which is equal to about 14,500 USD. Of course, Peter wasn't one of these employees, and he was also deceased at this point. So, was Peter to blame? Perhaps. Did he make some mistakes? Absolutely. As you can hopefully see from my explanation, this crash was a result of a series of mistakes unfortunate incidents and circumstances. I'm really, really hoping I explained this air crash as straightforward as possible and made it somewhat interesting for those of you that are not interested in aviation. There is actually an episode of Air Crash Investigation about this incident. If you want to check it out, I will link it down below. And now I've had my super nerdy av geek moment. Let's continue on. So back to Vitaly Kuliev and the murder. It wasn't long before Vitaly was arrested and charged with the murder of Peter Nielsen. Not only was the evidence overwhelming, but it wasn't long before Vitaly actually admitted to the crime. A crime that to this day he says he has no remorse and no guilt over. Vitaly was held in a psychiatric institution instead of a prison so they could assess whether or not he was fit to stand trial, and they found he was. But more on the trial in a moment, as I want to talk a little more about Vitaly and the circumstances that led him to murder. Vitaly Kaliev was born and raised in the city of Vladikavkaz, Russia. I hope I got that right. I really tried. Ugh. He had a wife, Svetlana, and two children, a boy, 10-year-old Konstantin, and a girl, four-year-old Diana. Vitaly worked as a builder and architect, and at the time of the plane crash, he had been working on a two-year contract in Barcelona, Spain. The contract was coming to an end, which is why Vitaly decided it was the perfect opportunity to fly his family out to spend some time with him and enjoy a nice little Spanish holiday together. Plus, he hadn't seen them in a while and he missed his family. There was apparently a few visa issues before his family flew out to meet him, but they sorted it out and managed to snag some last minute plane tickets on a chartered flight, which was of course the ill-fated Bashkirian Airlines flight 2937. Vitaly was eagerly awaiting his family's arrival at Barcelona airport when news began to trickle in about an incident potentially involving the flight his family were on. He decided to head to the site of the crash, which was in Überlingen, Germany, to find out what was going on for himself. And on arrival, his worst fears were confirmed. His wife and children had been in a plane crash and had perished. He begged authorities to allow him to join the search for his family, and 
they agreed, which seems highly unusual, but anyway. Tragically, Vitaly was the one to find the body of his four-year-old daughter, Diana. Vitaly would later say, quote, My daughter fell to the ground like an angel. Her body wasn't damaged at all. Trees had actually broken Diana's fall, leaving her body pretty intact. His wife and son's body were also located near the crash site. Several articles stated that Vitaly had actually spent his life savings on the headstones that were placed where his family were laid to rest. And looking at photographs of these very, I don't know if luxurious is the right word, but beautiful headstones really, it, it is believable. I will have them up on the screen, but the headstones are basically back and front with images printed, I guess, onto them of his wife and two children. But Harley later admitted that he lived in this cemetery for almost two years. In Vitaly's family home, he also made shrines for his wife and children. Again, I will have these images up on the screen, but he basically set up a room in his house with two beds and a cot, Diana's cot, with the photographs of his family, as well as toys and trinkets that belonged to them. And these are indeed very, very sad images and, and a real insight into what but Harley would have been going through at this time. And I show you these images and I bring up these points not to make you feel sorry for Vitaly because he did commit murder, but I think it's just important to give uh, both perspectives in this video. In the two years that followed the crash, Vitaly became a shell of the man he once was according to his family. He really went through a total and utter mental breakdown. His wife and children were his world. Again, not an excuse for murder, I'm just telling you both sides. And after all, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, right? That, that's the saying. Peter had a wife and three children. What did killing him achieve? Vitaly himself would later admit that killing Peter did not make him feel any better. And something else Vitaly would later say that I thought was a very interesting was that the murder was not a revenge killing, it was about avenging his family, which I thought was a pretty telling statement. So I just want to fill you in on a couple of bits of potentially missing information about the murder before moving on. Vitaly actually hired a private investigator to track down where Peter Nielsen lived. So that is how he found him, if you were wondering. And despite the fact that Peter was never held responsible for the crash, Vitaly remained convinced that he was to blame. Vitaly flew from Russia to Zurich alone in February of 2004 and walked to Peter's home on the day of the murder. When Peter came out to speak to him, Vitaly tried to show him photographs of his children in their caskets, but according to Vitaly, Peter pushed the photos away and then gestured for him to leave his property. Vitaly said that the imagery of seeing the pictures of his deceased children just fluttering to the ground enraged him to the point where he blacked out. He claimed that he never went there intending to kill Peter, but flew all the way to Zurich to simply have a conversation with him and get that face-to-face -face apology. But the knife Vitaly had on him, in my opinion, says otherwise. What Peter and Vitaly spoke about in their brief conversation is unknown, and because he blacked out, Vitaly claims he has absolutely no recollection of the actual murder. And I'm guessing no recollection of this conversation. He says that his next memory was arriving back at his hotel room covered in blood. The next day, police arrived to speak with him. The following year, in October of 2005, Vitaly Kaliev was found guilty of a premeditated killing and was sentenced to eight years in a Swiss jail. Vitaly appealed, of course, and after only three years, he was set free. 
It was later determined that Vitaly's mental health and his personal circumstances had not been fully taken into consideration and that he had acted with diminished responsibility. Now, this next part may be a part of this case that shocks me and kind of intrigues me the most. Upon Vitaly's arrival back to his homeland of Russia, he received somewhat of a hero's welcome. He was greeted with cheering, handshakes, and of course, because it's Russia, vodka. Local journalists even dubbed him the Man of the Year 2007. Vitaly is actually considered somewhat of a national hero, not by everyone, I will make that clear, but by some. Russia is no doubt a very different culture, and I really can't comment on it any further than that because I just don't, I don't know enough, and I don't want to speak on something that I really know nothing about. But if you are watching this and you are Russian, maybe you could give us a bit of insight insight on Russian culture. In an interview, Vitaly stated in regards to Peter, quote, he's nobody to me, he's an idiot, and that's why he paid for it with his life. If he'd been smarter, it wouldn't have to be like this. If he'd invited me into the house, the conversation would have happened in a softer tone, and this tragedy might not have happened. Vitaly continued, I think about his children. They're growing up healthy, full of life. His wife is happy with her children. The grandparents are happy with the grandchildren. Who am I happy with? End quote. So clearly he doesn't have any remorse or regret. Vitaly also received the highest state medal by the government called To the Glory of Ossetia. This award is given to citizens that have done great things, achieved greatness, empowered their community, etc, etc. You get the point. So, yeah. In 2018, Vitaly remarried and had two more children, twins. And in 2017, a movie was released based on this entire story called Aftermath, starring the Terminator himself, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I haven't seen it personally, so I can't comment, but Vitaly, who didn't have any involvement in the production, by the way, was apparently not exactly happy with the way the film, or the way, I guess, Arnold Schwarzenegger portrayed him. He kind of said that he was portrayed as, uh, these aren't his exact words, but like pathetic and begging and he said he would never, he would never act that way. He would never be that way. And as for Peter Nielsen's family, they have since returned to Denmark to try and begin a new life. And that is today's somewhat unbelievable case. I cannot wait to read your thoughts and comments below. I am a little torn on this one, but in my opinion, the murder was wrong. Although a very tragic thing happened to Vitaly, he did a very terrible thing in return. It just, as I said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. He And he punished somebody that didn't deserve to die. And now Peter's family have to live with that forever. In the end, the plane crash was an accident. No one single person can be blamed in this situation. As I, I hope I explained well enough, it was a series of events and a tragic story all around. But anyway, thank you so much for being here and listening to Peter's story and in fact every victim in both plane crashes, their stories as well. And until next time, stay vigilant and stay 